Ah, good morning. Uh, I think we are waiting on a gavel, but I think that will suffice uh, to call the um, Federal Workforce Subcommittee on Federal Workforce, U.S. Postal Service and Labor Policy um, to order. Today's hearing is entitled Back to the Basics. Is OPM meeting its mission? Before we begin, I would like to uh, start off with reading our mission statement of the Oversight Committee. We exist to secure two fundamental principles. First, Americans have a right to know that the money Washington takes for them is well spent. And second, Americans deserve an efficient, effective government that works for them. Our duty on the Oversight and Government Reform Committee is to protect these rights. Our solemn responsibility is to hold government accountable to taxpayers, because taxpayers have a right to know what they get from their government. We will work tirelessly in partnership with citizen watchdogs to deliver the facts to the American people and bring genuine reform to the Federal bureaucracy. This is the mission of the Oversight and Government Reform Committee. And I will begin with my opening statement. Since 1987, the U.S. Office of Personnel Management, OPM, has sought to modernize its retirement claims system. Almost a quarter of a century later, the system averages $120 million per year in payments to deceased individuals, while Federal retirees are subject to a paper-based process that often involves transfer of their file by truck up the Pennsylvania Turnpike for processing. Despite a backlog of 60,000 claims, OPM examiners are expected to process only three and a half claims per day. At the end of the employment spectrum, the launch of USA Jobs 3.0 has left many job seekers frustrated. A sentiment at odds with OPM's promise of doing it as well or better than the private sector, that the department, from the private sector company that the Department took over uh, several years ago. Having spent 18 months and $6 million to develop, Director Berry recently acknowledged that the newly launched online employment system went into a death spiral and admitted that the OPM's IT department underestimated both the system and the software challenges. Since taking over the online employment site, OPM has increased its fee to Federal agencies using the site for employment postings. Technical problems continue to plug the website. In other words, taxpayers are now paying for a system that doesn't work, costs more, and takes business away from the private sector. This raises questions about OPM's decision to craft an in-house system, given its poor history of information systems development. Combined, these management challenges raise questions about OPM's priorities. With a Federal workforce size of approximately 2.8 million people, the Office of Personnel Management is tasked with recruiting, retaining, and honoring a world-class workforce for the American people. Unfortunately, OPM's track record as of late calls into question its ability to resolve its hiring and retirement claims in order to meet its core mission. Today's hearing will examine OPM's efforts to modernize the Federal Government's hiring and retirement claims system, continued reliance on paper-based retirement system and technical problems plaguing the re recent launch of USA Jobs 3.0, raise questions regarding OPM's ability to utilize the information technology necessary to support individuals at the beginning and end of the job cycle. I thank the witnesses for appearing here today and look forward to your testimony. I now recognize the distinguished member from Massachusetts and the ranking member, Mr. Lynch, for his opening statement. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good to be with you. Uh, first of all, I would like to welcome Director Berry and, and Mr. Perry uh, for their willingness uh, to come before this, subcommi this committee and, and help us with our work. Today's hearing is entitled Back to the Basics, Is OPM Meeting Its Mission? and it will examine efforts by the Office of Personnel Management to address challenges in its information technology networks. Notably, this hearing stems from continuing reports of design and operational setbacks faced by OPM in the implementation and administration of USA Jobs 3.0, and also problems in the retirement uh, system. The late, this is the latest, uh, USA Jobs 3.0 is the latest iteration of the Federal Government's official job search website. We should remember why the performance of this project was insourced in the first place. Uh, government workers could do the job for less than the private sector had been doing, and the private sector contractor was unable to prevent serious breaches in data security, and as well there were concerns about uh, the proprietary uh, technology that was being used and its ability to uh, be flexible in the future to meet, meet uh, future needs. Regrettably, the launch of USA Jobs 3.0 has not occurred without incident, as the Chairman has noted. Within its first week of ongoing live 
uh, coverage of the USA Jobs website was slowed down by technical problems, including login difficulties, extended load times, and faulty searches. And throughout the past month, uh, USA Jobs has received an estimated 40,000 help desk complaints. USA Jobs 3.0 only went live last month, and the OPM Inspector General has yet to even begin auditing the rollout of USA Jobs 3.0. So were these problems simply the initial shortcomings or part of a longer-term systemic problem? I think it is uh, probably too early to determine, but uh, the early indications are not, are not good. One thing is already clear, however. To the credit of Director Berry, OPM has implemented a series of improvements designed to address these and other user concerns. In addition to enhancing bandwidth capacity in order to accommodate nearly 700,000 visitors per day, OPM has installed additional customer service personnel and resources, as well as increased its efforts to educate users on the transition to the revamped USA Job website. Moreover, in consultation with the Office of the Federal Chief Information Officer and private sector computer technology firms, OPM has also brought in a team of specialists with the goal of addressing both short-term and long-term issues with USA Jobs. Today's hearing will also examine OPM's capabilities in the area of Federal retirement claims. This is an area of particular concern uh, because we have an expected 100,000 uh, retirees. We also have in the works uh, the possible early retirement of maybe as many as 120,000 postal employees. So uh, it, it's a perfect storm, and we need to make sure that we have a, a system that can accommodate that volume. Today's hearing, uh, w unlike the U.S. Age Jobs 3.0 rollout, the issue uh, of the retirement uh, logjam is going goes all the way back to the mid-1980s. Computerization of older Federal employee records and automation of retirement claims are worthy goals if they also help to address concerns over levels of interim pay, improper payments to deceased annuitants, as the Chairman has pointed out, and the inordinate amount of time some Federal workers have had to wait to receive what is owed to them after years of dedicated service. OPM has already spent hundreds of millions of dollars on private sector contractors, but those efforts have failed to deliver. I sincerely hope that what we learn here today is not a precursor of of challenges that lay ahead as Federal agencies are forced to do more with a lot less. So, Mr. Chairman, I thank you for holding this very important hearing, and I certainly hope that we can finally get to the bottom of some of these problems, given the impressive list of witnesses appearing before us today. And I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Lynch. Uh, members may have seven days to submit opening statements and extraneous material for the record. We will now welcome our first panel of witnesses. We have with us uh, Mr. Uh, the Honorable John Berry, who is the Director of the Office of Personnel Management, and is he, he is accompanied today by Mr. Matthew Perry, OPM's Chief Information Officer. And pursuant to the committee rules, if you would uh, all stand and be sworn in, raise your right hands. Do you solemnly swear or affirm that the testimony you are about to give this committee will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Thank you. Let the record reflect that all of the witnesses answered in the affirmative. Um, I will now recognize uh, the Honorable uh, Mr. Per Berry for his opening statement and request that you limit your testimony to five minutes, as your entire written statement, of course, is in the record. Mr. Berry. Chairman Ross, uh, Ranking Member Lynch, thank you very much for the honor to appear before you today to discuss how OPM is accomplishing its core functions. I am proud of the role that we have played in a historic eight presidential actions on human resources. The percentage hiring of our veterans and disabled veterans is the highest it has ever been. And our hiring reforms have both shortened the time to hire and made it easier for applicants, the resume being the basis now. Our Merit System Audit and Compliance Division annually conducts over 220 audits just this year alone that safeguard our merit system principles and hold agencies accountable for effective HR practices. We now process 90 percent of security clearance investigations, over 2 million a year, in 40 days or fewer, having eliminated all backlogs and taken this issue off the Government Accountability's Office high-risk list this year. Finally, we continue to strengthen both our CIO and our retirement divisions. And before the end of this month, a new detailee will be joining OPM to assist Matt 
as our new Chief Technology Officer, and they will enhance and centralize our IT operations with MAT at OPM and provide new leadership for USA Jobs 3.0 going forward. In January 2010, the Chief Human Capital Officers Council unanimously recommended, after months of study, to design a hybrid USA job system, not an in-house system, a hybrid system, where the government will protect applicant data and own the code for a central portal that has an open architecture to it to allow for greater private sector competition to foster enhancements. This marries what I believe is an essential core governmental function with the strength of our private sector. During our transition from USA Jobs 2.0 to 3.0, we successfully transferred 22 million resumes and documents and over 6,000 open job announcements. But we also made mistakes. We underestimated demand, we lacked agility, and we did not resolve applicant issues as quickly as we should have. Immediately, visitors flocked to the site, peaking at almost 45 million paid searches in one day. This exceeded our highest estimates and, at times, 100 percent of our bandwidth. In response, we have added 10 virtual servers, fine-tuned load distribution, and added content delivery support from a trusted private sector vendor. With the site now operating at about 10 percent of capacity, this issue has been resolved. Second, passwords had to be reset for all of the users. This was our largest issue among the over 54,000 Help Desk request tickets. To address this, we redeployed Help Desk resources from other OPM program areas. Third, our location-based search tables, though extensive, needed tweaking. By expanding these tables, we have largely resolved this issue and continue to refine the tables based on user feedback and proactive analysis, again in partnership with Microsoft the company provider for our server. Our team with advisors from the private sector and across government continues to work around the clock to resolve issues and refine our search tools. All USA job metrics continue to make steady progress forward. Since the launch, nearly 17.5 million users have visited the site, submitted over 1.2 million applications, and created or edited nearly 700,000 resumes. Our help desk tickets from a peak of 4,000 a day yesterday were below 400, which we would consider an average load for the, a system of this size. Yesterday, our Facebook posts in the first week, as you can imagine, were significant in volume. Yesterday, we are down to 11 posts uh, uh, total. On retirement, $100 million and four failed attempts over 20 years uh, have all met with failure. The most recent ended just before I took office, not only without solutions, but sadly also with reductions in retirement staff that was presumptuously made before the system was launched and then ultimately terminated. Using lessons learned from the canceled retirement system's modernization, we have created a proof of concept that would allow retirees and HR professionals to submit their data electronically. We have had to make do with fewer staff and reduced budgets. But despite that, I am prioritizing this issue. And within our resources and moving and shifting resources around last year to hire a 35 new legal administrative specialists, and we will be hiring additional this year to be ready, hopefully, for this onslaught that uh, Mr. Lynch has mentioned. We are also taking steps to use our existing staff more efficiently. For example, we have assigned all FERS non-disability retirement claims to our staff in Boyers, Pennsylvania, and focusing our D.C. team on the backlog in disability claims. Today, a Navy Six Sigma team is specializing in process improvements is at work in Boyers with our team. We are working with other agencies to ensure the completeness of records that we receive so that we can move faster in processing claims. To mitigate existing delays, we have enhanced our interim pay process. Retirees now, over 90 percent, are approved to receive interim payments within a week of their application. It is my goal that the steps we are taking will address our backlog within 18 months and fulfill our commitment to Federal retirees with more timely processing. 
Members of the committee, thank you for having me here today, and I am happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Director Berry. And I will now recognize myself for the first round of questions. Um, you know, I am reminded of um, an economics professor I had in college who said that self-sufficiency breeds inefficiency. And I think when we start doing certain functions in-house that uh, <coughs> there are not the resources uh, to do, we, we, we become somewhat inefficient. Just because the Federal Government has a motor pool doesn't mean they have to manufacture the automobiles. And, and to that end, I would ask you, um, Director Berry, uh, why did you decide to bring the USA Jobs in-house? Um, this was an issue that was under great study. We had a contract with a private carrier that was a five-year contract that was going to expire, knowing that that was coming. Uh, this contract was paid for by fees that are paid by each agency across the Federal Government into a revolving fund that we manage on right. their behalf. And that, was, that, that, that private contractor was Monster? Yes, sir. Okay. And so they managed uh, the, the USA Job Site 2.0 for the past five years. Um, we created a working group of the Chief Human Capital Officers Council because that is the group that has to pay for whatever decision was going to be made to study in depth this issue. That working group came back with the recommendation to create a hybrid solution, again, not an in-house solution. And as a re that, that recommendation was made as a result of the fact that the private sector uh, contractor was not doing it efficiently or effectively, or was there a conclusion that they could do it better in-house? No, sir. Let me give you the four reasons that they, they made that, that the working group provided. The first was it, they thought for the central warehouse warehousing system, it was important that we would be able to own the code and the data. What happens over a five-year contract, which is, which is natural, is you get good data in the first two years, but any tweak you want to make throughout, you have to pay to increase or to change. Um, you know, in, in this vibrant time, we wanted to make upgrades faster and quicker. So owning the code was one of the first decisions that the work group decided was important for us to have for that central warehouse But don't you think that could have function. been negotiated in a, in, a, in, a, in a contract renewal in terms of the it, ownership? It would, but the contract renewal being five years and anything during the interim would have to be supplements to the contract, which would cost the taxpayer more. By owning the code, as we have proven over just the past three weeks, we have been able on a weekly basis to update the code without having to incur costs. Uh, working with our partner, again, a private sector partner, Microsoft, is the, the, man, you know, is the provider of our server currently. Right. So we are working with the private sector. The other, the other three things, just very quickly, of what the working group decided, they wanted to protect the sensitive information of applicants. We had, they had contracted a, a study with a third-party private sector company, Booz Allen Hamilton, that did a vulnerability assessment of the Monster product. They determined that there were two security concerns. One, that resumes were commingled with both public sector and private sector resumes commingled. And two, there was a medium level risk of alternate data centers being co-located in the same geographical area. And those were anticipated risks. They actually happened. Yes. Well, the, the, the security breaches that happened to Munster are a matter of public record. Now, right. I want to make clear. None of the issues that we faced in our first week were the result of Monster. Uh, they were our right. in-house problem. But the working group was considering the 2009 and 2007 security breaches that occurred when Monster was the provider for 2.0. So, so the working group, security was one of the issues the working group considered. The other two, just very quickly, was they wanted to enhance search capability and then, fourth, have an open architecture, have the government protect the resumes but build it in a way that any private sector provider could come in and plug into it to use their product, keeping in mind the resume sort of warehouse is only $6 million. The, the, the private sector providers that compete around that is well over $100 million of business. So where the action is, is on those private sector enhancements that plug into it. So those were the four reasons the working group considered in bringing in this hybrid solution that was part in-house, Part open okay. architecture to allow for greater competition. When you talk about your partnership or working with Microsoft, um, actually, though, you didn't partner their assistance in the development of the USA Jobs, did you? It was actually post launch when you started to bring them in. Well, no, it was their their product is is the main server right. provider for us. So we we, we acquired that, uh, you know, and and. But there wasn't any there wasn't any working relationships in advance of the launch of USA Jobs with Microsoft, was there? Well, yes, but they have they've added additional staff to us when we ran into the problems. In other words, they have stood behind their product. It is a good, solid product. 
And you, you indicated to The Washington Post uh, that, that if you knew now what you knew then, you would do things differently. What would you do differently? I think the key thing we did was we focused a lot of our testing efforts on the private sector, back end users, and the agencies. And we did not focus enough on the applicant user experience. And if I had that to do over, I clearly would have spent more time on applicant testing. So did you, I mean, do you have a market research uh, department or, or somebody that would go out and, and, and consult with the end user as to what they anticipate and expect from the service? No, sir. But what we do do is survey our users on a, re on a, on a regular basis, as well as using all of the traditional tools that, that, that the Internet now allows through Do you have a media. research and development department that, that you invest in to make sure that you are staying on the cutting edge of, of technology? No, sir. We, we partner with the private sector to accomplish that cutting edge. Did you partner in the development of the USA Jobs 3? Absolutely. And as a result, it, you crashed? Well, I would say, like I say, the first week is not something I, I uh, was, was happy about. But what I am here to say is we have recovered from that. And as many people know, as it, whether private sector or public, launching complicated large systems like this sometimes have bumpy starts. We had a very bumpy start. I apologize uh, for I, that. And I believe we have put the right team in place and we have made the right judgment call since then to recover from it. How much do you charge agencies to use USA Jobs? Uh, the cost uh, for the entire product line for uh, providing the central warehouse, it, uh, let me give you the budget, is $12 million a year. And it is, that is what agencies were paying in 2008 when Monster was providing the service. It is what agencies are paying now. There has been no increase. There the has 19, not been any increase. The 19 percent is what we did in two years while, we were while the work group was working to decide what to do. We rebated funds. You know, when you have a revolving fund, you accumulate some to, to handle a new project. We were accumulating funds, but we, did, we had too, many, too much, so we rebated them to the agencies. That created a two years. We went from 12 million to 10 for two years. So 08, 12, 9, 10. 10 was 10 million. We are back to 12 now in 11, and it will stay at 12. So there is no increase, you know, other than we provided the, the agencies uh, that rebate uh, while we were not designing the new system. Gotcha. Director, my, my time is up. We will probably do another round, so I will uh, now recognize uh, the ranking member, the distinguished gentleman from Massachusetts, Mr. Lynch, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Director Berry, good to see you again. Thank you, sir. I wish it was under different circumstances. <laughs> wish we were talking about something that was going right, uh, but that is the nature of this. Uh, I, I do want to uh, have I was here in 2007, uh, and I do remember back then when Monster was, uh, was running this, uh, this program. And we had, uh, as I remember it, we had 146,000 Federal employees who had their information stolen uh, when, when Monster was running the program. And uh, they had their personal identity, uh, you know, information uh, access. There was a cyber attack on, on the site. So that was one of the reasons that we we initially uh, supported the idea of of coming in house to make sure that we can protect the ident identities and the information that that uh, we have on our employees. So that you know, the folks that are complaining about you after the first month, this this site went live a month ago. And it is a huge site, like you say, 700,000 people accessing it every single day. Uh, it is a big operation. So I have a bit more patience than I guess some of my colleagues, but not much more. I understand. Uh, I, I do want to ask you a, a couple of things. Now, just about resources over at OPM. I know you got some good people over there and you are working hard, but uh, I know that you picked up additional responsibilities under the Affordable Care Act. So I, I see all this work being put on that agency. I don't see any more resources. I believe you are being In charged, fact, less, if, I, if I recall correctly, under the Affordable Care Act, you are responsible for setting up all of these exchanges that all these folks in America are going to go online and try to access these State health insurance options. And you are responsible for doing all that with, without much more resources than you have now. On the, you've got a 60,000 backlog on retirements. These are just folks that work their whole life for the government and want to retire now. And you've got 60,000 of those folks waiting to retire. We can't process them fast enough. 
we don't have enough people uh, to process that, that information. We are looking at uh, early enhanced or expedited uh, uh, retirements at the Postal Service that could amount to 120,000. You got NASA retirements. We are cutting down there. We have got the Government Accountability Office retirements there. We got Defense Department, including the Air Force and, and Army, major, major uh, retirement programs going on there. So I see this whole tidal wave of, of work heading towards you, and I am just concerned that you don't have the resources to, to deal with this. And, and uh, I just, uh, it troubles me greatly. What I see, I see a lot more of these hearings. I see we are going to spend a lot more time on these hearings as, as just the volume of work overwhelms you. Now, I am not faulting you. I am not saying you are you, not working fast enough or hard enough. I just think the volume of work is, is overwhelming. Now, you say you are going to hire 35 you know, new folks to process retirement claims. You know, I just did the math on that. that that is an additional 40 to 50,000 a year. But you got, you've got probably five times that much that, are, that is brand new on top of the work you are doing already. So uh, how, how are we going to do this? How we, what, do you, what do you need for resources over there to, to meet the challenges that, that are, are coming towards you? I say this as a friend and as someone who wants you to succeed, not only on behalf of folks that are on the, the job website, but also hardworking retirees who worked a whole life, and now they are being given interim retirement because we can't process their applications to retire. These folks want to retire. They have retired. Sure. And, and they are waiting out there month after month after month, and their, their applications for retirement have not been approved. So it's a, it's a terrible situation. We have got to get our arms around this. I know you have got a paper process for a lot of these employees, but my goodness, we have spent $100 million over, over the last 20 years, and we still got this same broken system. We have got to, we've got to build this system, have a sustainable system, the right technology, the right information, the right people, and get this thing done. This is just a nightmare. But uh, what do you need over there uh, to get this thing done? Well, uh, sir, as, as you know, uh, uh, I have to defend the President's budget, uh, and uh, our resources, like many across government, are on the decline. Uh, we are uh, trying to do more with less, and uh, we are trying to increase our efficiency to do so. Um, I am proud of our team uh, in, the, in, in, some, in many areas. Um, when you look at, for example, the preexisting condition health uh, 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 plan that needed to be the exchange that needed to be stood up, uh, we are providing options for people with preexisting conditions in 23 states in the District of Columbia now, and we are doing it at a .08 percent overhead. Um, we did that and stood that up in 60 days and launched it. And we have, it has been well received by those states and the people in those states. So we have solid people. We have solid teams. Um, it, you know, but there is no question that, as, as you mentioned, we are facing uh, a, a potential uh, increase, a significant increase in our retirements. We are no, noticing them actually starting this month. Um, normally, the wave increase doesn't start till January. It has started for us this year in October. So, it, it, you know, as agencies are looking, increasing their buyouts and other options to uh, tighten their belts, it's increasing our retirement pressure. One option that I, I could propose that the Senate is considering in uh, one of uh, the bills that is under consideration there is, as agencies do uh, buyouts that they would uh, also in, you know, make a payment to us to, to help us cover the cost of processing that retirement and hiring temporary staff that we could handle some of this backlog bulge, a balloon, if you will, that we are facing. Um, and, and so we are we're, we're looking, at, you know, that would be one assistance that the Congress would be greatly appreciated. But efficiency improvements also, and I think uh, you know, the Navy Lean Six Sigma team that is working with our people today one of the things we want to do, where I think why we have wasted so much money over the past 20 years, and, and I can't testify as to the details of what happened there because it was before my watch, but I can tell you this. I think the process could be more streamlined, and we could do a more efficient job. And that is why working with this Navy team, we are trying to make the process as straightforward and as simple as we can. And my hope is, is if we can get it simple, then you can automate pieces of it. 
Uh, the last attempt failed because they tried to automate everything. And some retirements are extraordinarily complicated, as, as you can imagine. When you have a disabled, uh, you have different uh, reserve service in different theaters of war with different retirement calculations for different days that they were in service in different regions of the world, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but there are standard retirees. There is someone who worked. If you could just wrap it up, we're a little I'm, over I'm sorry, time. Sir. That's all right. Real quickly, if there, for example, there would be a standard retiree, someone who spent their career at one agency, didn't have all of those complicating factors. Let's identify those and automate that piece, and then move forward. We need to automate this in bite-sized chunks that we can deliver successes to you and the Congress and the taxpayer. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Sorry, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Uh, I now recognize the gentleman from Florida, my colleague, Mr. Mack, for five minutes. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, and uh, thank you for uh, holding this hearing. I think it is an Im important topic. And before I go on with my questions, I just want to relieve you of some of the pressure you think you are going to feel down the road. You won't have to deal with the Affordable Care Act. It is unconstitutional. Either the courts will find it unconstitutional or in the next Congress we will repeal it and the next President will sign that repeal. So you can rest assured that you won't have to deal with that piece of, of the puzzle. Um, interesting, listening to uh, the, the conversation today, uh, one of the things that keeps striking me is why in the world would, why in the world would you uh, put in place something that would take what the private sector can do, more affordable, uh, more agility? I mean, they deal with pressure. You think you are under pressure. How about the free market pressure? I mean, if these companies don't, don't perform, they go out of business. If you don't perform, you come to Washington, you ask for more money, uh, and you try to make changes. So the pressure that these private, in the private, end, or, or the private world uh, are much greater than any pressure you might, might be feeling within the agency. Um, so why would the Federal Government develop products and offer services that the private sector can do more efficiently and effectively with greater expertise and at a lower cost to the American taxpayer. Why, why, the, the crux, why would, I mean, I have seen this in State government, I have seen this here in Washington. It is almost like there is a, you have, you are opposed, I am not saying you, but there is this mentality that you, can, that, the gov, that you can do it better when we know that private companies can do it much better. Is it okay, sir? Uh, yeah. Uh, okay. <laughs> I didn't want to cut cut. No, you no, off. I got more. Oh, okay, <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Mack. I, you know, first let me let me be clear. This is not an attempt to be a, a, to create a government solution. This is what the Chico Council recommended, and what we have moved well, no, forward on. Well, I know. But, uh, it's I hear a what, hybrid solution. I hear you say hybrid. So just because you buy Microsoft servers doesn't make it a hybrid system. And, ju and just because it, I mean, I'm sorry. I just I know that that you want to paint this as a hybrid system, but this is something that you have taken in house, uh, and that you're developing in house. When there are companies, private companies, who can do this more efficiently, more effectively, more secure than what you're offering. I mean, look, well, the federal government has a hard time uh, keeping secrets, and if you know, don't take my word for it. Just look at WikiLeaks. So the idea that somehow we could feel secure that um, that you all have created a system that is going to be secure. I, I just well, well, sir, we do have a system that is very secure, and it is a level 4 security that provides all of the background investigations, including the, all of those for the Department of Defense, that we manage at our Boyers facility that, in Pennsylvania. Uh, it is, uh, it, it is it, you know, one of the most secure IT websites run in partnership. Again, it is another hybrid model. I don't think that the I don't think that people are, I don't think I don't think confidential people, information I don't think that the people feel that secure knowing that you're holding all their information, but get back get back to this private sector issue why why would why would you go you know why would you think that you can do it better when um, the forces of uh, you know in the private sector are much stronger what what the core decision was was and it is in any discussion that as the government undertakes these systems is to define what are core government responsibilities and what are core private sector responsibilities. In this case, protecting the personal information and resumes of applicants for Federal jobs 
was a core governmental responsibility. And, and the private sector can't do that? I, I can, sir. And the, the, can the private the sector do that? that? The private sector encountered over the past five years are a matter of public record. You can see that they were compromised. It is not a guarantee that the security is going to be protected. And the, and federal, gov the federal government hasn't been compromised in its ability to keep secrets? Sir, we both have to wrestle. Cybersecurity is an issue we both wrestle with. But and instead, but instead it, you're, we're already here. I mean, what I've heard is that you're going to need more money to keep up with it. And you've had, your track record so far on this is not very good. Let me ask you this. Do you, uh, do you directly require or otherwise force Federal agencies to use the tools and products that OPM develops? No, sir. Uh, are, are agencies penalized uh, on their performance if they do not use the tools and products? No, sir. Uh, what steps are you taking to ensure agencies don't feel compelled to use your products? Uh, sir, the, any products that we are providing are done through a competition, and agencies are not forced to, in fact, in this system, and the reason why I said this was taken to the Chief Human Capital Officers Council. It had to be adopted by the Council because the Council has to agree to make the payments of the system. Uh, we could not mandate. I do not have taxing authority on these agencies. They are either voluntarily choosing us through a competitive process or, in this case, making a decision on creating this approach which we undertook and, and, then, and then making the assessments necessary to fund the product. And there has been no increase. We are at $12 million in 2008. We are at $12 million now. It will be $12 million next year. There is no increase in terms of cost to this system. Mr. Chairman, my time has expired, but uh, I, I applaud you for taking on this issue because uh, I, I hear what the gentleman is saying, uh, but I, I, I question whether or not um, uh, this idea that government can do it better than the private sector is, is a valid one. Thank you. The gentleman yields back. And I will recognize the gentleman from Illinois, Mr. Davis, for five minutes. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. And let me thank both the witnesses for being here. Uh, Mr. Director, uh, both you and, and Mr. McFarland's written testimony suggested most of the improper payments to deceased annuants are usually recovered. And Mr. McFarland noted that most of these payments are the result of a retiree passing away just before the payment is made for that month or because there is a delay by the person's family in reporting the death. You also talk about fraud deliberately perpetrated by decedent's family members. Uh, my questions are here, can OPM control or prevent these things from happening? And does this mean that there will in all likelihood, always be a certain amount of overpayment that we then will have to try and recover. Uh, Mr. Davis, thank you for, for that question. Um, uh, first, uh, I think it is important to point out that uh, uh, we are in complete agreement with the recommendations that the Inspector General has made regarding this issue and, as he has mentioned, have implemented 10 of the 14 recommendations and have recovered of the $500 million that was identified, uh, all but $113 million, and we are in the process of pursuing that final $113 million right now. Um, <clears throat> so, uh, you know, we take this very seriously. Uh, fraud has got to be followed through. Uh, but it is important to point out that uh, this is I believe, if I am correct, if uh, is one-fifth or, Matt, you help me on the detail of this, it is either one-fifth or two-fifths of one percent uh, uh, is the amount that has been identified here that uh, we have on an, you know, uh, that uh, we are dealing with. I am not, you know, it is critically important and we are not going to tolerate any and we are going, our goal is zero. But I also want to point out that it is a percentage rate that, um, any credit card company, uh, any any major fund manager, uh, at at that rate uh, is is doing a pretty darn good job. But again, our goal is zero, and we are we are rapidly implementing the final recommendations that are still open. The reason why they haven't been closed already is one of them requires us to work with the banking community, and so we're working through the Treasury Department and the banking community. And in fact, maybe this committee could even help uh, in that regard. Because if we, could, if we could have easier electronic data transfers between banks, 
who are, are making, you know, are helping us with these deposits, we could identify these fraudulent activities even faster. So, <clears throat> but we're, we are implementing them, sir. <clears throat> I, I, I do agree that two-fifths of one percent is two-fifths of one percent, and it is money, and it does reflect Absolutely. error. But I also think that it is a pretty good record in comparison to what we know about this business and this approach to it. Uh, I understand that OPM will be performing computer matching between OPM's retirement annuity role and the Social Security death master file annually and checking on retirees over 90 years old every other year. Given the resources at your disposal, would it be possible to conduct the computer matching on a monthly basis and a check with older retirees every quarter or perhaps six months? Mr. Davis, that is a great idea, and it is one that we are working on doing and trying to automate it so that we can, we can do that on a very regularized basis. Uh, to identify and, and flag where we are having problems or issues in that regard. But the answer is yes, absolutely. We can, we can do, we are working with Social Security and we are, want to work with Treasury and financial institutions to do that in an automated way so that we can get that number to zero. And do you think that it will actually give you the results that, that, that you are seeking and, and that it really works for you? Oh, you know, we have to be careful because what we are talking about here is fraud. And, you know, there are bad people in the world who will, you know, we, we will fix one way and, and catch them one way and bad people will invent another. And so I don't want to say, you know, our goal is zero and we will need to be ever vigilant on this and our inspect we work very closely with our Inspector General to, to maintain that vigilance. Um, but I think I, I, it would be naive to say that uh, uh, people won't be able to invent other ways that we'll have to, to, to stay current with. So this is one we can never take our eye off the ball, Mr. Davis. I agree with you, one dollar is too much if it's lost through fraud. Well, thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. My father always told us that wherever there is a wheel, there is a way, and bad people will always be looking for the way. But thank you for your efforts and thank you for your work. Thank you, Mr. Davis. Thank you, Mr. Davis. Um, we'll go another round since we got you here. Uh, a couple of questions before I get into the retirement um, processing claims. Uh, it, it's my understanding that in the USA Jobs 3.0, you did consult with uh, private industry in advance. Well, we we worked. You know, keep in mind that back end of house is all private sector. I mean, you know, most specifically, private, private information technology companies. So, did, 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 that you consulted with prior to the, the launching I, of 3.0? Would it be okay to ask? Oh, please, Mr. Perry. Yes, sir. You're Mr. Sworn Perry, in. my CIO, who is involved <laughs> with this, he can answer that more accurately. The answer is yes. We, we reached out to other private companies. We also talked to companies such as Google and so forth in advance of and then even after the post launch. Uh, specifically, with uh, going back to Director Berry's comment on Microsoft, as you know, most times you deal with a third party vendor. Uh, we, in the case of USA Jobs, uh, excuse me, uh, USA Jobs 3.0, we in fact well dealt with a third-party vendor, which was certified by Microsoft throughout the whole. I'm sorry, uh, throughout the whole process, uh, they're still on board today, and we also then supplemented with uh, Microsoft corporate. Are, are you still working with Monster? I mean, did, did you not have them? Did you have them on contract as well during this whole process? They're still on contract through the end of this month. And it is also a bridge contract. So if we wanted to extend it, if we if we needed to for data transfer or data, have they been providing any consultant services with regard to USA Jobs 3.0 or any services whatsoever? No, they've been very very supportive, uh, particularly with the data data transfer. We had some issues. Uh, they helped us work through all those issues and get the compliance that we needed. Oh. Thank you, Mr. Perry. Uh, Director Berry, to go to the other uh, side of this coin, and that's the the processing of the retirement uh, claims. Yeah, I, I mean, this is the tough one. Three and a half claims a day, 60,000 behind, $120 million in annual payments that have been um, misappropriated. Uh, the average processing time for a case is 133 days. I mean, if there ever was a case for automation, this is it. Uh, but more importantly, it also seems like this is not, uh, while it may be complex and may involve a lot of agencies, the system, the infrastructure by which claims processing is done for the retirement system, 
there ought to be a system already in place, at least in the private sector or somewhere else. So why reinvent the wheel when that wheel turns out to be a square wheel not moving you along very fast? I mean, have you looked at other options? Well, sir, I, there there's been a lot written on the last attempt to take a, a private sector solution off the shelf and implement this in, in the last administration, and in, in not to point any fingers, it was it was terminated, and right. and, and and so, um, you know, it, it, there have been attempts, and and that is we have looked at that and we looked at the lessons learned. I mean, and, taking and, the transporting by way of truck, all these applications. I mean, scanning ought no, to be. You're absolutely forced. right, and, and and that's something we're doing. We are we are scanning documents, and we're working with agencies. One of the things, Mr. Perry, uh, the CIO, has done to his credit, working in our retirement. You know, one of the, one at least uh, bright spot has been he has worked with the agencies to provide for more electronic transfer of the data files in the first place. Uh, you know, it used so do to be you have a business plan in place to bring it up to date and a deadline on which to bring it up to date? Uh, we are not in, in full yet, sir. We are still, like I said, you should do that, shouldn't you? I mean, absolutely. If, I, I mean, you are the only game in town for these, for these retirees. Absolutely. And, and, and it's, yeah, it's difficult for them, I imagine, having to wait and not know what their retirement checks are going to come in. But I would think also from a business perspective, because I think this is an essentially business function, that you should have in place a business plan as to how to bring the 60,000 backload uh, up to par and how to automate it so that this is avoidable. And, and I, would, I would hope that that is being done. It, it is, sir, and, and, and we are working. Part of that is, that is the getting that process refinement and that Lean Six Sigma team's results. Uh, once uh, that is in place, we are looking at all the three elements of this, which is additional resources, which I am going to do within our budget. We are going to, again, move resources around, prioritizing this, knowing that it is so critical we be ready to handle these, these issues. Improve the efficiency. You are right. Uh, 3.5 is, is not acceptable. Uh, but keep in mind that is an average. So you are looking at some cases are very simple. They can be, you know, some people can do easy <laughs> cases. We are going to break that down now. And, and, and what we have done in the past is only look at an annual number. But we are going to break that to a monthly number to increase the accountability, and we are going to break them into the type of cases so that we can really dog and track where we are having problems and incentivize, uh, as, as well as you know, for true outstanding performers who are going above and beyond, I am happy to pay them because it is a lot cheaper to give a bonus but, for that progress. I guess my concern is, and as, as to allude to what um, Mr. Lynch talked about, you know, we may be having many hearings on this, unless there seems to be some indication that there is going to be resolution of this problem. And a resolution means challenging yourselves to meet a deadline. Plans become goals when you give them deadlines. And I guess what I am asking is, is are there any deadlines in place to bring this up to date so that we don't have this problem? Sir, we are working at very we will have to you in the very near future the plan that you are discussing. And I look forward to coming back and going through that in great detail with <laughs> You're you. On. Because it really does, go, we we have got to tackle this from a multitude of angles, and I agree. one of them is, is just what you mentioned. We've got to automate certain parts of this, and I, I think rather than try to automate all of it, if we can automate the the easiest pieces, and one of the things we'd like to look at is, for example, an innovation grant program. The VA has had great success with this, where you identify the problem and you put it out on the net with a with a cash award. Uh, to uh, to solutions. incentivize and, and to incentivize it and and private sector can, people, everybody can respond to that individuals can respond to it quite frankly okay. and and we can grab the best idea and so we're looking at literally every approach we can take to to have innovation on this this problem because where we are now is not acceptable thank you uh, I agree director my time is up the gentleman distinguished gentleman from Massachusetts the ranking member Mr Lynch recognized for five minutes uh, thank you again Mr Chairman. Uh, Director Berry, I know that uh, in the private sector, uh, when, when we have a situation like this where you have a huge volume of work, it is pretty uh, standard that uh, companies will reach out and bring back some of their recent retirees. Now, I know you have had a wave of retirements from the very people who approve these applications. These folks are well trained. They have been doing this for 20, 30 years. They know the system inside out. And now we are short of people. Have you, have you tried to, I know we have we've addressed this, tried to address this issue before where we can call some people back, just, just till we get rid of this backlog, and then, then we will, you know, since they are already retiree, we will we'll just put them back out on retirement again. It is a very efficient way to, to do it. They are already cleared uh, for security reasons. They are already familiar with the system. It would seem that that, that would be the easiest way. Uh, to, to move some of these uh, applications through. 
Mr. Lynch, it is a great idea, and it is one we are pursuing and, and, and working with retirees that we might be able to bring back uh, to do just that. The other thing we are doing is, I, in talking with my head of our retirement services, I made clear this has got to be all hands on deck. And we need to look at anybody who has ever processed cases. They might have moved on to a different project or a different responsibility. Until we get this backlog under control, they got to go back to doing cases. Right. And, and, and you know, as I said, all hands have got to look at that. And, and even the Director of Retirement Services, I said, you may not be able to process a case yourself, but you can, go f you can go fill in the missing pages from the agency and get them online and get those papers delivered so the person who knows it can do it. Yeah. Everybody has got to be involved in fixing this. We have got to get this backlog down. We have got to get this to a more reasonable time. The, the one bright spot is our accuracy is holding. Even with the delay, we are running you know, it's sort of at a 96, 97 percent accuracy rate, which we regularly test for, for all processing. So what I have told people is our, our goal is simple. I want accurate service, I want faster service, and I don't want backlogs. And we've got to do that with good customer service. And where, so, where, where are we actually doing this work? Well, physically, where are we doing it? Uh, two places, sir, primarily. Boyers, uh, the, primarily in Boyers, Pennsylvania, which is western Pennsylvania, north of Pittsburgh. Uh -huh. um, and we also uh, have uh, the operation for the disability claims here in Washington, D.C., and, and a retirement operation here. But the, the larger operation. How, how many folks do we have engaged uh, in, in doing this work uh, in, in Boyers? You got Get a figure on that? Or? If, I, if I could get you that exactly for the record, uh, sir, we would give you the we we'll give you the exact breakout of, of both workforces yeah. in both places. Here's, here's what I'm getting at. This is a mess. This is a mess, and it can't continue, and it looks like it's going to get worse. So rather than have that happen, uh, we have to get involved. This committee has to get involved. The subcommittee has to get involved. So, you know, we may have to go out to Boyers and and actually, you know figure out what the heck is going on there and, and uh, figure out what needs to be fixed. Sir, and if you need resources, then, because these periodic hearings, if, if work doesn't get done between hearings, it is just endless. Uh, what I would like to do is get right into the weeds and kind of figure this whole thing out. I know you, uh, in other branches, uh, we are laying off people at the IRS. These are qualified employees who, you know, have a great accounting background, probably have all the necessary tools to do this type of processing. Rather than lay them off, yep. if, if uh, you know, if we could bring them over to this side to use their, their skills and ability on helping us on this problem. But this is, this can't continue. This cannot continue. This is an embarrassment. We got, you know, 60,000 people waiting to retire, to, you know, to get their applications retired, and it is going to get a lot worse. This is a, you know, this is a log jam that's just going to grow and grow and grow. So we got to get a, our arms around this thing. So we're trying to help, uh, but you know, it seems to me that this has, you know, maybe with the turnover and folks, uh, you know, we haven't really addressed this problem. We're just sort of whistling through the graveyard here, and we need to really make this a priority and get this thing done. Uh, you know, because once it's once it's on even keel, where we can do these things within 30 days, I think the system will run itself. But right now, we have an unsustainable system, and we need to figure it out. Mr. Lynch, I, first I would welcome either you, or, and I know the committee's time is precious, or the committee staff on, uh, from both sides to to join with us as we as we peel through this onion and come up with the, our our business plan strategy on on how we can fix this. Um, but you are exactly right. And when you go back to the resource question, um, it, it, it is it perplexing to me that someone would reduce all the retirement staff under the presumption that a new system was going to work yeah. and then have the system fail, and we never put back those staff. And we are continue here today, three and a half years, to still wrestle trying to dig out from that hole. And, and I have been able to, like I said, we, brought, we, we hired 40, we lost five. They, they you know, fell out through the, the hiring and training process. So we have 35 that we are putting on the front lines. But we are going to, I told them, bring on it, we have got to bring on another 40, because as you, as you rightly mentioned, we get 9,600 cases in a month. We process about 7,700 a month. That is a shortfall of 1,900. Right. And so with the backlog, you know, that can, is going to continue to worsen until we can get those numbers right. And we have got to be at this 
it is a combination. I don't want to say it is all resources. It has got to be also efficiency. We have got to drive our employees to be better and smarter. We have got to provide them the training to do that. Um, but some of it is resources, and, and we are going to be stepping up as best we can, sir. All right. Thank you, Mr. Director. I appreciate that. Thank you. The gentleman from Minnesota, Mr. Wahlberg, is recognized for five minutes. Michigan. Well, we are all coal country, so. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but I am glad to be from Michigan. Um, and I uh, apologize for not uh, being here uh, till this point in time. So I would be delighted to yield uh, any remaining time uh, back to the Chairman if he has further questions. But, uh, uh, Mr. Barry, I, I would like to just uh, follow up on what I have read, uh, the research we have done on the subject, and just ask you uh, the question, do you stand by your decision to make USA Jobs a hybrid system? Uh, yes, sir. Uh, even with the challenges and the backlog and all of the frustrations that it had and really uh, the sense that we are going backwards? Uh, in, in well, sir, I, I would I, I'd argue clearly, as I admitted in the testimony, we could have done better, and, and I sure wish we had the first week to be different. Uh, but where we are now, it, pick any metric you want, they are all moving in the right direction. Our help desk tickets are down from 4,000 to yesterday they were less than 400, which is for a system of this size, 700,000 contacts a day is a normal usage help desk contact base. We are projecting that going forward with just normal questions of how do I change my password, et cetera. Um, but you know, looking in terms of applications, agencies being able to successfully post their jobs, applicants to successfully file their resumes and compete for jobs. Uh, we are rapidly approaching over a million resumes that have been, uh, you know, uh, and ap uh, job applications. But we wouldn't be better off back using a contract with a private sector. Sir, I, I, I think from what we are seeing is uh, that this hybrid solution, I think, was the right call by the Chief Human Capital Officers Council. And uh, we had a bumpy start, but I think we have, have uh, put in place what needs to be done to make this work going forward. Um, it is with, with time, and, I, and we will obviously keep the committee fully abreast on where we stand with our metrics, but right now we are moving in the right direction. I think to go backwards uh, would, would waste an awful lot of resources and, and put things into greater confusion. I think right now we are at a place where if we continue our steady progress forward, uh, both the taxpayer and applicants and agencies will all be well served. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Uh uh, the gentleman yields his time, and I will just to follow up on a question with regard to, the, again, the retirement cases. The $120 million annually that is average that is being misappropriated by being uh, paid incorrectly or inadvertently to others, are you taking any immediate steps to put a stop to that? And if so, what were those steps? Oh, yes, 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 sir. And, and I think we go into that in great detail in the, in the written uh, response, Mr. Chairman. But, uh, but let me make clear. Uh, the, the, the IG made 14 recommendations. Ten of them have been fully implemented, and we are hard at work on, on implementing the final. Uh, Including forward. verification. And, and uh, doing the verification. And of the $120 million a year, uh, he, he mentions uh, looking at a five year window, a, a total of about $500 million that we were wrestling with. And, and we have been after recovering all of that. Uh, we are down to the final $113 million of that 500 nut. So we are not leaving, as Mr. Davis said, any dollar or stone unturned. And, and I want to point out, this is not the result of misfeasance by the agency. This is fraud. This is active right. fraud, people breaking the law. Because they have to assert or aff yes. affirm that they are alive. Yes. And, <laughs> and, and, and so, you know, we want to catch them. We are after catching them. We're, we have done the automated uh, comparisons with Social Security that the IG recommended. And, and the last piece we are working on is to work with the banking system so that we can have faster exchange of inf on an automated basis that way, um, because that will allow us to identify the fraud faster and, and eliminate it quicker. So uh, we are hard at work at it, sir, and, and I believe that one is one we, are, we have a good record on. Thank you, Mr. Berry. And I will recognize the gentleman from Illinois, Mr. Davis, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Director Berry. You testified that OPM plans to address the retirement claims backlog in 18 months. I believe that there are currently 60,000 cases, I'm told, in the backlog. Is that right? Yes, sir. All right. I also understand that OPM receives approximately 100,000 claims a year, not including early outs and buyouts. 
OPM has had a backlog of cases for years, and the agency has tried for 24 years to automate its retirement claims processing system. That said, I also understand that you have shifted resources to hire additional personnel, completed training of 35 legal administrative specialists, started work on an online application, and been able to reduce average case processing times from 138 days last year to 125 days this year using existing staffing capabilities. Nevertheless, problems still exist. Is that correct? Yes, sir, Mr. Davis. And we still have a backlog that we have to resolve. Could you tell us how many toll staff you now have working on retirement claims? Uh, if I could, Mr. Davis, uh, as, as Mr. Lynch requested, we will give you an exact breakdown not only of, of the current staff, but where they work between our Pennsylvania operation and our D.C. operation on retirement, sir. Um, do you think we will get to the point where we see light at the end of the tunnel? It is obviously perplexing, and we have got some distance to go. But, but how do you project? that we will end up? I, I think there are four key elements, and, and they will be the pillars, if you will, mis that in the Chairman's business plan that we are trying to craft. Uh, some of it is, is, is improving our, our process, and that goes to the Lean Six Sigma team we have discussed. Some of it goes to holding our accountability for our performance, improving our efficiency, having our employees do more and more accurately. Some of it goes to resources that we have discussed with Mr. Lynch. And finally, some of it goes to agency connectivity, which we are trying to improve through an automated basis. Right now, about 20 percent of the cases that we get from the agencies are incomplete. And so we have to go back. In other words, one of the reasons we can't begin processing to adjudicate that claim is we are missing pieces of the file. And we have to go back and reconstruct that. That takes time. If it, to the extent we can work with agencies to resolve that and have retirees work with their agency, if they, if they have the luxury of knowing their retirement is coming, to help make sure that their file is complete and accurate, because that greatly expedites the time in which we can, we can then process those claims. So I think those are the four pillars, is better agency cooperation and connectivity, better performance and accountability, better process, you know, doing the process simpler and, and smarter and the right level of resources, which is going to require us, quite frankly, to put more bodies on this. Until we have some of these IT solutions in place, we can't kid ourselves. This is a paper-pencil process. It is going to take more people. Well, let me appreciate everything that you are tr trying, and especially do I appreciate the last mention in terms of the right level of resources. I understand that you just cannot get blood out of a turnip. You know, you, you can squeeze it, you can tease it, you can do all that you can do, but you still end up with turnip juice. And, and as we go through this process of cutting and eliminating and trying to figure out how we approach budgeting and spending, I think if we want certain results, I mean, in some instances we are simply going to have to bite the bullet, put the resources in, and, and then our expectations can be real in terms of what we get. Let me thank you for your efforts, and uh, I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. The gentleman yielded back. I, that will conclude our first panel. Uh, Director Berry, Mr. Perry, thank you both for being here. We look forward to continuing to work with you and uh, hopefully to a satisfactory resolution. Mr. Chairman, thank you, sir. It is an honor always to be with you. Thank you. And we will take a brief recess now for the clerks to prepare for the next panel. Thank you. Okay.